Behold the rose of Judah from tender branch has sprung from Jesse's lineage come he as men have old have sung it came a flower bright amid the cold of winter when half spent was the night I say I had foretold it in words of promise sure and Mary's arms enfolded a virgin meek and pure through God's eternal will she bore a, for men a savior at midnight, calm and still. Praise be to God, my dear friends. Here we are drawing very near to this very night. Such a moment of Kairos in the entirety of human history a crux point the birth of our lord and in fact that is our hope and that is what we sing for we desire his coming unto us especially in these very faithless times especially in this time when he full grown and his bride being mistreated come lord jesus and i'm gonna read to you from the liturgy of the hours from this past tuesday the day after the abomination document was released from rome with a green light to bless homosexual unions and that's exactly what it is. You know, they said, uh, not in this way, not in, th in that way, but it is already happening. Dissident priests, dis dissident bishops who are, in fact, uh, committing those abominations on the altar of the Lord in the sanctuary of the Lord as the sacred author would say they already have raised your temple to the dirt Lord and burn it with fire they have struck together with hatchet and pickaxe and defamed your altar and that's what's going on so it's important to understand in context why the Lord allows this and, and what the Lord is doing. So from Tuesday, the, the first reading from the Office of Readings was from the prophet Isaiah. And when the people of God give themselves into abomination to the Lord and to infidelity to God in tremendous ways uh, this is what the Lord has to say about it and then that's followed by a treatise against heresies by Saint Irenaeus one of my favorite saints he was a bishop of the early, early church and a champion he's one of my favorite saints Saint Irenaeus and it's a, the second reading is an excerpt from a treatise that he wrote against heresies. And the church <clears throat> in her humanity is ripe with heresies at this time. You know, and that's the, that's the major portion of offense to God. And it is what has uh, scattered 
the people of God to the four corners, to the four winds, to the wilderness. It has scattered God's people. That's why you see tremendous lack of faith in the world. What do they say? It's nearly 80% of Catholics do not believe in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. What a crazy thing. But that's the times in which we live because of the decades of heresy that have been spewed out as a poison to God's people. And therefore, the little sheep of the Lord, the flock of the Lord, has been uh, dispersed to the wolves. And the wolves were the one who dispersed them. So they are being, you know, lost to God. But the onus of responsibility is to the wicked shepherd. To the shepherd who did not care for the flock. And they have, they have made a destruction of God's little ranch, his property. They have broken down its walls and came against it with ramparts. Or to destroy its ramparts rather. And they have made a mess. Recognize those terms? They've made a mess of God's holy vineyard. Uprooting and destroying everything. And they'll get what's coming to them. But it's important for you to understand and to know these things. So that you don't lose your place to God. That's why it's necessary for you to understand the meaning, the substance of the words of the prophet Isaiah for our time. And to understand very clearly uh, why it is so dangerous when shepherds give themselves into heresy and when they promote heresy. When they promote lies against the truth revealed to us, there are tremendous consequences. And in knowing that, you can be strong. If you possess these knowledges and wisdoms given to us by God, you can be strong and you can endure this storm, this crisis. So when the Lord sees fit to liberate and to vindicate his holy bride anew. Because I'm telling you, these are absolutely the worst of times. But that's whenever God's grace is most beautiful to us. It's light most brilliant. These are wonderful times to live, even despite their tremendous anxiety. So let's listen. And I hope that you draw strength from this and hope and even joy that you can be very happy to celebrate with joy this holy Christmas, even as the house of God is on fire. Because we trust to the promises of the Lord. From the book of the prophet Isaiah. Come down. Sit in the dust, O virgin daughter, Babylon. So the church is the virgin bride, <clears throat> the virgin daughter of God, the father betrothed to Christ and ratified in his nuptial commitment. He laid down his life for his bride. She belongs to him and she is pristine in beauty. And her virginity pure. But the, the prophet calls her Babylon. Because in her humanity. That's us. The church. The people of God. Worse than any imagery of prostitute. That you can bring to your mind. Anything that you can imagine about. Nastiness of prostitution. 
The humanity of the church has far surpassed that as the bride of Christ. Filth, disgust to God, abhorrent to God, repugnant to God. He can't even stand the smell of the infidelity of his people because it has become ripe with infirmity and nastiness. So she needs to be purified. And that's exactly what the Lord allows through tremendous suffering, which we are experiencing. And the way that the Lord always chastises his people throughout history is to remove his blessing from their leadership so that in fact they are exposed and given into hard labor to enemies. Sit on the ground, the Lord said, dethroned. You lose your place. O daughter of the Chaldeans, no longer shall you be called dainty and delicate because you have abused your beauty and you have spread what has been given beautiful to you to every passerby of the world, to the Chaldeans and to the Babylonians, to a foreign people, to people who know nothing to God. In other words, you've prostituted yourself. I will take vengeance, the Lord says. I will yield no entreaty, says our Redeemer, whose name is the Lord of hosts, the Holy One of Israel. That's the Lord. We love the Lord and we recognize his singular supremacy. No one compares to the Lord. And there is no challenger in the whole of creation that can ever stand up to God. Arrogant in presumption as man may be, he can never stand up to God. Absolutely never. Go into the darkness and sit in silence, O daughter of the Chaldeans. No longer shall you be called sovereign mistress of kingdoms. Angry at my people, I profane my inheritance. The Lord allowed this to us because of our infidelities, because we do not keep to his commandments. And we give ourselves into every whim and notion of the world. As it said yesterday, into curiosity, we are seduced. I gave them into your hand, but you showed them no mercy. So to the enemies, to those who are enemies to God, on their part, they take advantage of the opportunity. They bend the bride of Christ over a barrel. That's what's taken place. And again, I remind you that no semblance of masculinity or strength is, is applicable to these rebels because they are sissified men. They're light in the loafers, homosexuals, most, most pointedly sodomites. So it is not a, a proper application of terms to, to define them in any way to a masculine term. But it is true that they have bent the bride of Christ over a barrel. And they believe that they have their way with her, but they will not. They will not have their way with her because the Lord in his goodness allows for suffering that we may be healed. That's always how the Lord operated. And so what we have to endure, 
we who who are resolved to be faithful to God, we who believe in God, that's us. We have to endure and face this crisis. That's the bottom line of it. So you have to set your heart not to become so wearied, not to become so anxious that you that you go crazy and lose your mind, but that you patiently set yourself to endure these things, to endure them patiently, and to hold out to the end. That's what the Lord desires for us, to hold out to the end, to the time of fullness of His vindication. And, and I, I, I remind you that it will be all the more sweeter for these tremendous seasonings of sufferings, the seasoning of suffering that is upon us. Tears, salty tears that season and prepare for the great feast, the wedding feast. That's the fullness of gathering in the kingdom of heaven. I can't wait for that. Because for all the suffering that we've endured, that I've endured personally, the anxiety, uh, I also am very worried. And tremendously, you know, there has been tremendous consequence to my mind, my heart, my body. Coming to knowledge of these things and seeing it with my own eyes. But I, I resolve to trudge on forward one step at a time through the mire and through the, the grayness of these times, the death of these times with absolute confidence to the promises of the Lord that He will fulfill, the vindication, the wedding feast. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it even dawned on the thought of man the wonders that God has prepared for those who love Him. It's amazing. You know, even in my youth when I was so innocent and unknowing to anything that was bad, and even though there was a certain poverty that I lived in, because all of us do, uh, I was very happy, very blessed, having no knowledge or thought or concern for, for the hardships that lied ahead for myself and for the entirety of the world. I was so oblivious to those things because I was just innocent as a child. And I was very, you know, creative in my mind and able to to have fantasies about many things, beautiful fantasies. I was free and able to run like a child free in the fields, unhampered by any dangerous thing. And so, but even at that, I could never, even in that purity, I could never imagine or even touch an imagination to the reality of the kingdom of heaven. That's our hope. That gives us drive to, to keep going. God bless the Lord. So the Lord said, I gave them into your hand, you wicked abusers. And you showed them no mercy. And upon old men, you laid a heavy yoke. See, they don't care about people. They don't care about poor people. What do they call them? A basket of deplorables. You are beneath them, they think, the powers of the world. And that is in the secular order and in the church. Those same sentiments uh, actually have their origin and in, in greatest potency 
in the personages controlling the dials inside the church. They are more wicked than the wickedness of the world. It's hard to imagine, but that's true. They are more wicked than the wicked powers and persons of power in the world. Amazing. They lay heavy yoke upon the old men. You said, I shall remain always a sovereign mistress forever. That's what you say. But in your infidelity, but you did not lay these things to heart. You disregarded their outcome, the Lord says. So you did not keep to my ways. You did not think of the Lord. And therefore you suffer. Therefore you are pushed to endure these things. Now hear this voluptuous one enthroned securely. Again, he's speaking to you. You thought that you were so safe. You thought that God did not see these things, that you could take of the fruit that he told you of which not to eat. Saying to yourself, I and no one else, I shall never be a widow or suffer the loss of my children. That's what you thought. But you see now, look how many people, it's, it's to the vast majority of people of our time who know not how to parent rightly, who have allowed their children to be exposed to every infirmity and filth of the world. And you reap the, the whirlwind of that, that your children are absolutely out of control. They give you gray hairs and broken heart and tremendous anxiety because of their lack of respect to God or to anything of, of the created order. They are rebelliousness come to fullness. That's how you have lost your children, as the sacred author said, prompted by the Lord, the Holy Spirit. You said, I shall never be a widow. <laughs> Divorce and destruction rampant to God's people and children lost in the darkness, even coming to fullness of maturity in it fullness of manhood and womanhood, knowing absolutely nothing to God or knowing absolutely nothing to the order of creation. That's why we're in the state we're in, for the infidelity of God's people. Both of these things, the Lord says, shall come to you suddenly in a single day. You see how these things have seized upon us. We suffer tremendously for our infidelity to God. We have given ourselves to Babylon. And Babylon has had its way with us. Complete bereavement and wi widowhood shall come upon you. That's why there, what is it? I don't even know the percentage. It must be. 70% of marriages end in divorce. I was just, uh, last night, I received a message as they were, they sent me a message of, of uh, you know, rejoicing in this time of my birthday. And, and they said, we celebrate 55 years of marriage on the same day. And I was like, wow, double nickels in marriage. And that's longer than I've been alive. I'm 51 years old now. And they have been married for 55 years. God bless them. God bless them. That's very magnificent. Very magnificent indeed. But they are in a, in the great, 
smaller percentage of success. I would say even to, it could be 70% of marriages and especially they say even Catholic marriages. Yeah, because Catholics do not know. We have been like sheep without a shepherd and therefore we give ourselves into tremendous infidelities like divorce. God hates divorce every time. There's no such thing as divorce to God. And I laugh at the foolishness of the church. This is one of the greatest offenses of the, of the institution of the church and those who, who are responsible for her. And it was one of the first things that this jack wagon did back, uh, you know, some more than 10 years ago, expediting the process of annulment. In, in other words, rubber stamping uh, annulment, you know, disregarding to the sanctity of marriage. How many countless people do I know who have lamented to me? who it was by no intention of their own, they are divorced. And even with the approval of the church, the approval of the church, that's absolutely ridiculous. There are many priests and bishops who will absolutely lose eternal life for their disregard for the holiness of marriage. And there are many, many people who deceived by those false shepherds will lose eternal life for their disregard to the sanctity and holiness of marriage. And there are many of these foolish people who will show up in front of God and to show some document like that and to say, look, it's uh, my annulment. The church granted me an annulment and the Lord's going to be like, get that out of my face. That don't mean nothing to me. Into the darkness you go, where there is wailing and grinding of teeth. I never knew you. And those arrogant persons approach to the altar of the Lord and take the Holy Communion and act as if everything is fine and dandy, as if there's no problem at all. What a tremendous day of shock will be the great and terrible day, the coming of the Lord. That's what we long for this Holy Advent, far greater in importance and in, pra in praxis is our plea to the Lord to come in His second coming, the fullness of His glory and to put an end to this foolishness, to put an end to this pain and hurt that has come upon his virgin bride. These things, the Lord says, shall come upon you suddenly in a single day. Why? For your many sorceries and infidelities and the great number of your spells. Oh. The Bride of Christ has prostituted herself to demons, to sorcery and to spells. Because you felt secure in your wickedness. <laughs> you felt secure in your wickedness. It's like in the time of Noah. It said they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving into marriage right up until the day that the first drop of rain came from the heavens in the deluge, that for 40 days and for 40 nights it did not stop raining. Can you imagine how they were clamoring to the highest places they could find and then inundated by that purge? Only Noah and his family and those creatures in the ark were, were saved. Only Noah and his family and those creatures in the ark. Everything else over the face of the earth was destroyed. Amazing. Praise God. 
And that's how it will be in the second coming. And many will be caught by surprise because they felt secure in their wickedness and said, no one sees me. <laughs> the Lord sees all things. That's why we put our house in order to God. To you who have faith, that's the only thing that's important. Don't be disturbed. You will, you will hear that. Don't be disturbed about all the things that are going around. You keep your eyes on God. You put your house in order to God. And you won't have to worry. You don't have to answer for the infidelities of that priest or that bishop or that pope. You don't have to answer for the infidelities of that person or that person. The only thing that you will have to present to God is yourself and you will stand naked before him. Meaning that nothing will be hidden. Everything that will be exposed. And that's why right now is the time for you to grasp the opportunity for heroic virtue. To be saints. Jesus was the one who said, in those last days, I will raise up the greatest saints. May you be numbered among them. May you be added to that number of holy ones. Your wisdom and your knowledge, the Lord says, led you astray. <laughs> Presumed wisdom and knowledge. When actually there is no wisdom whatsoever. It is a void of wisdom. That's why I say to these jack wagons. And I stole this line. Which is absolutely defining to the reality. From a holy priest. I love that priest. Numbered am among the first of the cancel priests. He said to the bishops. You have educated yourselves into imbecility imbeciles you know nothing to wisdom nothing to God and you said to yourself I and no one else you think yourself to be like God but upon you shall come evil you will not know how to predict bring it on Lord amen you will not know how to predict this evil disaster shall befall you bring it on lord we long for that day it is already way too far way too heavy are these wickednesses put upon your bride upon your holy people i know so many beautiful faithful people who are so stressed out and distressed over this abomination document that came out of rome and they are increasingly distressed by the by the lack of, of uh, solicitude of the watchman to be concerned about it. I hear so many priests and different people opining from different sides. Oh, it's not that big a deal. Nothing's changed. This is a monumental shift. And it's not anything new. This has been going on for generations and decades and even for a century plus and it's just coming to fullness of maturity but i can see it as plain as day the marxists have always operated in the same way the marxists always operate by the same playbook so you can see the work that they do uh you know very plainly the way they operate the vast majority of people are unaware of that. I don't know why. After even centuries of this playbook being leveled against the, the people of God. If you compare it to football, they've scored touchdown after touchdown. We know the playbook. It's the same playbook. They keep running the same play. <laughs> yeah. And they deceive. And they trick the people of God. And they score points against us. But they don't realize that we have the ultimate, you know, X factor. That's the Holy Spirit. And that's why the day of destruction will, see, will seize upon them that they had no way of predicting. They were not able to predict it. They were not able to, to see it. And therefore they lost to it. 
That's the way it will be for many, many, many of them. And that's great. I can't wait for that day. I wish it were already here. Disaster shall befall you, which you cannot allay. Suddenly there shall come upon you ruin, which you will not expect. Bring that ruin upon their wicked heads, Lord. Keep up now your spells and your many sorceries. The Lord's mocking them. Go ahead, just keep it up. Perhaps you can make them avail. Perhaps you can strike terror. And that's why I tell you not to be terrified. How many times did the Lord tell us, peace be with you, do not be afraid. And that applies to us, absolutely. As to every generation, as to every people, and especially for now. In the midst of this storm, the Lord tells you, why are you afraid? He is offended by your fear. The Lord takes offense in your lack of trust, in your fear. And your lack of confidence to his promises. That's why I'm telling you. Put yourself to be faithful to God. Do not fear. Trust in his word. Trust in his promises. The Lord will not fail you. Do not give into. Into the, the void of, of despair. You wearied yourself with many consultations oh my goodness how these wicked men consult sorcerers and things of this world they try to measure everything looking and measuring this looking and measuring that they can never measure or predict the power of the lord they're fools absolute fools And with these consultations at which you toiled from your youth, they have been about it for a long time. You know, it baffles me when I look at them, how they can be so wicked, uncaring to Lord, uncaring to the Lord, lacking in fear to the Lord, even though they're so weak. And I see them plain as day. They have no care of the Lord. They think that even from their youth, they think that they don't have to worry about these things. Let the astrologers, the Lord said, stand forth to save you. See if you can depend upon these things of the world, like the kings and powers of old whom the Lord destroyed. You will share in the same lot, you wicked men. The stargazers who for forecast at each new moon, what would happen to you? <laughs> the Lord tells them. He mocks them in their foolishness. Lo, they are like stubble. Fire consumes them. Bring the fire, Lord. Let it come forth from your mouth to consume them. They cannot save themselves from the spreading flames. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Thus do your wizards serve you. You imposters to the seats of the Lord with whom you have toiled from your youth. See, they toil with their wizards and soothsayers, but never is truth found in them. That's why they're, they're perpetually afraid. They're looking, trying to measure everything, wondering when the moment will seize upon them. <laughs> And it will. That's going to be a great day. That'll be the great day when the righteous who have been, who have had their face put into the dirt will be vindicated. And all will be made right. That'll be great. The mountains will be made low and the valleys will be filled in. Everything will be made right. Smooth. That's why it is necessary for you to renew your faith to God this holy Christmas. To sing to the Lord that song. Well, we can change the words a little. I do all the time. 
sing to the Lord. Last Christmas, I gave you my heart. The very next day, I gave it away. Because we're not faithful to the Lord. You know, we give ourselves, but then not completely. We take it back. So we say, <coughs> this year, this year, I will renew it to you. I'm giving it to someone special. That's you, Lord. And hopefully, you know, we say to the Lord, hopefully for good, for keeps, for keeps, Lord. Let us move to a treatise against heresies by St. Irenaeus, Bishop. Lord, we praise you for this holy bishop. And we ask you in your mercy to give us holy bishops like an army to put the house of God in order, to put these foolishness down forever. The plan of redemption through the incarnation. God is man's glory, St. Irenaeus says. That's true. He's the only glory of man. Man is the vessel which receives God's action and all his wisdom and power. Thank you, Lord. Just as a doctor is judged in his care for the sick, so God is revealed in, in his conduct with men. That's why we need holy men. Authenticity of holy men. For the sake of God's people. Because the, the people of the Lord are able to recognize what is true and what is not true. That is St. Paul's reason for saying God has made the whole world prisoner of unbelief. That he may have mercy on all. He was speaking of man who was disobedient to God. I'm sorry Lord. That we have been disobedient to you. And I'm sorry for the disobedience. That burdens your sacred heart. I'm very sorry to that Lord. We love you. And we do not want to disappoint you. Nor to be disobedient. For man has cast off. From. Morality. Let him cast off his immorality. That he may find favor. Find mercy with you Lord. If man. Without being puffed up or boastful. Has a right belief regarding created things. And their divine creator. That's why we. We cannot al allow our hearts to be puffed up. We become too prideful, think ourselves to be God, and that's where we get in big trouble. We are not God, who having given them being, holds them all in his power. And if man perseveres in God's love and is in obedience and gratitude to him, he will receive greater glory from him. That's what you told us, Lord. If we follow to your ways, if we humble ourselves to you, you will give us even greater things. That's our hope. How beautiful. We long for that. It will be a glory which will grow ever brighter until he takes on the likeness of the one who died for him. That's the Christ. He it was who took on the likeness of sinful flesh. Jesus, born unto us as a man, born unto us with the death sentence upon him. He was made for the Via Dolorosa. That's why he said, I behold, I make all things new. When he embraced the cross. Why to condemn sin and to rid the flesh of sin? As now condemned. God bless you Lord Jesus Christ. 
He wanted to invite man to take on his likeness, appointing man an imitator of God, establishing man in a way of life in, in obedience to the Father that would lead to a vision of God and endowing man with power to receive the Father. What gift the Lord has given us. He is the Word of God who dwelt with man and became the Son of Man to open the way for man to receive God. These are thoughts in right order. This is what has been revealed to us. For God to dwell with man. This is freedom. This is fullness of blessing. This is prosperity. And that's why I want you to renew your life to God as a people. So that you're no longer just bound in slavery. But that you may live according to the will of the Father. Free born and prosperous. For this reason the Lord himself gave as the sign of our salvation. The one who was born to the virgin. Emmanuel. God is with us. That's our Lord Jesus Christ. It was the Lord himself who saved them. For of themselves they had no power to be saved. We can never save ourselves. Although as cowboys we have that saying, you know, I pull myself up by my bootstraps. And in a certain way, I mean, that's absolutely true here in the natural order. But we will never be able to save ourselves. No, no cowboy can save himself, much less any person who is less than a cowboy. <laughs> oh, we love the American cowboy. What a, what a great thing. The Lord loves the American cowboy. For this reason, Paul speaks of the weakness of man and says, I know that no good dwells in my flesh. We recognize that, Lord. That reminds us always that we are not gods. Our own flesh when we look in the mirror daily, we are reminded, in fact, we ain't God. He means that the blessing of our salvation comes not from us, but from God. Yes. Again, he says, I am a wretched man who will, who will free me from this body doomed to die. I say that a lot to myself, especially that I'm 51 and I recognize the progressive loss of strength little by little that comes to my mind, my body, to all things. There is only one whom I can depend on, and that's the Lord. And nothing else of this created order do I put my trust, but to God alone. He alone. And I realize that my body is doomed to die. That's why I don't trust my body. You know, I feel pains and stuff. I could be diagnosed with stage 4 cancer tomorrow. I'm 51. My grandfather, my dear, beautiful Bubby. My Bubby. I love that guy. I was 9 years old when, when he succumbed to, to the cancer. And he was a, only the tender age of 54. He was the greatest guy ever. Love that guy. I've offered many, many holy masses for him. And I cried and cried when he died. Me and my brother. It was, it was the first time we felt the sting of death. We cried and cried and cried. Because we don't trust these bodies. These bodies are not made for... for we are not made for this world. This body is not made for this world. It's made for the, the resurrection, for eternal life. And that's why we want to be to God. That's why we recognize that God alone is God. Then he speaks of a liberator. Thanks to Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. He is the liberator from all these things. And that's why even in advanced age, and compromised in every strength that we depended on. 
we recognize that there is only one liberator, our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be Jesus Christ now and forever. We love it that he humbled himself to be born unto us, to take on our humanity in order to bring it into fullness and oneness with his divinity anew. Isaiah says the same. Hands that are feeble grow strong. Knees that are weak take courage. Hearts that are faint grow strong. Fear not. See, our God is judgment and he will repay. The Lord will repay all things. He himself will come to save us. We believe that, Lord. We believe in you and that's why we can keep going. He means that we could not be saved of ourselves, but only with God's help. Amen. Thank you, Bishop Irenaeus. And that's why I encourage you, my dear people, on this 22nd day of December, as we draw near to the end of Advent and the fullness for which we have hoped the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ and His coming in glory, we have cause to hope and to be happy and to stand up for what belongs to God, to the truth to God, to bear witness as we were born to from our baptism. We are prophets of the Lord. And to say to kings and to princes and to the lowly one and to the powers of this world, Christ is the only salvation of the world. And His truth is the truth. And when you say these foolish things, like it's possible to bless same-sex unions under these circumstances, I call BS on that. You can tell them, I call BS on that. That ain't Jesus. That ain't what Jesus taught. In fact, that's exactly opposite of what Jesus taught. And that's why I recognize you as a fraud, as an imposter. You are not holy to God. And nor are you exercising the holiness of your office. You are a charlatan, a liar. And I don't pay any attention to you. And in fact, we're all getting together and deposing you. That's what should happen. And you ought to start on the grassroots level. You ought to tell in every parish that you belong to, you go tell your priest. You gather together as a people and you tell your priest, you better never bless any homosexual union because if we find out about it, we're going to tar and feather you, Father. You ain't, you ain't going to make it out of this town, out of this parish, if you do anything like that. And you ought to gather together in groups of thousands and go to the chancery and knock on the door and wait for that bishop with knees trembling, knocking together to come to the door, pull him outside and to tell him, you tell all the people of our diocese that there is no such thing as blessing of homosexual unions. There's no such thing as blessing sodomy. And to Rome, cut off any support that you give to her. And demand for, for a newness of accountability there. And don't take no for an answer. Because no man in any position is higher than the Lord himself. And to the one who was ordained to serve the Lord. If he does not fulfill that. It is your duty and your birthright from baptism. To remove him from that office. That's true. Because your birthright from baptism. Is to have good shepherds from God. These are your rights. And in fact your duties. I hope that you understand. And that you take heart for this holy Christmas. I give you the blessing. The Lord be with you. And through the intercession of the holy saint. 
Irenaeus, through the intercession of St. Thomas, the Apostle, whom we celebrated yesterday, the man of faith to God. He was a holy priest, a holy bishop to God, and he believed in the Lord. Don't you remember he was the one who said, my Lord and my God? As a bishop, he had the wisdom to recognize that to the Lord. And we praise the Lord for his witness and example as he died a martyr somewhere in India. As he went to proclaim the gospel. And through the intercession of all the holy ones, may God bless you to renew your faith to the Lord, to have confidence to the Lord, and to celebrate with full heart that you may have a happy and holy Christmas. And the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Adios.